Tonight we are having, we are celebrating 50 years of Cut Bank Literary Journal. I believe it's in the next room over at 445. I see as many of you there as possible. And uh, after that we will all be decamping uh, to either Cranky Sam's or Word Dog or both because they're right across the street from each other. Um, and if you are interested in sharing something at a literary open mic, show up early. Doors are at 6.30. Uh, all that being said, um, we're grateful to uh, many of our partners this year, namely Doubletree uh, and uh, the Mansfield Center, both big sponsors this year. And uh, yeah, finally, we're still f raising funds. Uh, we're at about uh, $1,100 of our $3,500 goal. So if you have anything to give, you can give it at the information booth. We sincerely appreciate it. If you want a little something for your troubles, we still have plenty of we, the uh, raffle that we're giving away for the show and the uh, gift card to Brass Report Rouge. That is, uh, there, there are not a lot of people who have put into that raffle tickets. Uh, so the odds are fantastic. <laughs> I highly encourage you to uh, contribute to that. Uh, the show, uh, Blackberry Smoke, is on the 13th. Uh, even if it's not your cup of tea, you get to sit inside the beautiful Wilma. <laughs> Alrighty, now to introduce our authors for the day. Christine Bile is the author of Lookout, long listed for the 2023 Center for Fiction's debut novel prize, and Dirt Work, an Education in the Woods from Beacon Press in 2013. A book about trail crews, tools, wilderness, gender, and labor. It was shortlisted for the 2014 Willow Award in nonfiction. Christine has worked as a professional trail builder for 25 plus years. She lives with her family in interior Alaska on the homelands of the Diné. Sonora Ja is the author of the novels The Laughter in 2023 and Foreign in 2013 and the memoir How to Raise a Feminist Son, a memoir and manifesto from 2021. The Laughter has earned rave reviews from the New York Times, The New Yorker, India Today, and The Seattle Times and received starred reviews from Kirkus Reviews, Booklist, Bookpage, and others. Sonora is formerly a journalist covering crime, politics, and cultures for the Times of India and for East Magazine, Singapore. She moved to the United States to earn a PhD in political communication. Dr. Jaw's op-eds, op essays, and public appearances have featured in the New York Times, on BBC, and in several anthologies. She's a professor of journalism at Seattle University and also teaches creative writing for Hugo House, Hedgebook Writers Retreat, Creative Nonfiction, and Seattle Public Library. Finally, Kristen Miares Young uh, is an essayist, journalist, and author of the novel Subduction, named a staff pick by the Paris Review and called Whip Smart by the Washington Post, a brilliant debut by the Seattle Times, and utterly unique and important by Ms. Magazine. Winner of Nautilus and Ippy Awards, Subduction was shortlisted for the VCU Cabell First Novelist Award, named a finalist for two International Latino Book Awards and Forward Indie Books of the Year in 2020. Her essay, book reviews, and investigations appear in the Washington Post, The Guardian, Literary Hub, and the anthologies Advanced Creative Nonfiction and Latina Outsiders and Alone Together, winner of a 2021 Washington State Book Award. A former prose writer in residence at Hugo House, she is the editor of Seismic Seattle City of Literature, a finalist for the 2021 Washington State Book Award. Kristen was a researcher for the New York Times team that produced Snowfall and which won a Pulitzer Prize. She is the 2023 Distinguished Visiting Writer for Seattle University and the Seattle and the University of Washington Bothell Master of Fine Arts program. And in that order, we're going to start with a reading from Christine Bile. Uh, yeah, like five minutes. Okay. Uh, if you want to use the microphone, too. I probably should. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming on such a beautiful day. This library makes the should I go inside problem a little bit easier. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, I always read from the beginning. I think I'm just going to go out on a limb and read from a chapter a few, about 30 pages in. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything you need to know. I think you'll be able to pick it up set in Western Montana. The title of the chapter is Pay Attention, and it's set in 1987. 
One Saturday in December, Cody saddled Daisy right after breakfast. She used to ride with her sister, but Louisa had turned 14 in July and didn't want to go anymore, especially not on weekends. Now there were boys, the new kid, Jess McCafferty, and a senior named Brandon with his own truck. Even Nate Lindsay was interesting again. 14 was much different than almost 12. So Cody was on her own. Fine, Daisy was good company. A young, shapely brown mare with a black mane and tail, Daisy had a smooth trot and walked like she was in a parade. Cody loved cantering, Daisy the water, herself a small boat. The dog stayed home, Brisket the cattle dog was too old to keep up in the heat and Jade the husky gave the horses wide berth. She didn't deign to follow. Cody spurred Daisy down the dirt road to burn off the barn steam and then west cross country to the top of the butte. It was an odd formation, the only one around, rising out of the meadow grass like a high stage made of dirt. Daisy was a natural at switchbacks, traversing up the steep side slopes and then pivoting direction on instinct. Cody hardly guided her. The loose gravel poured away from Daisy's hooves and left streaks of dark streaks of moist soil. On top of the butte, it was breezy and warm, not so high as the mountains, but above most of the trees, and you could see in all directions. Cody dismounted and let Daisy graze in the rocky grass while she poked around, looking for arrowheads or scat. To the north lay fenced grazing lands, cows dotting the grass, their calves old enough to wander off and young enough to bleat and bray when they realized they were alone. To the south was forest service land, eventually turning into the Bob Marshall, where the Kinslers took horse trips, and Josiah had worked as a packer at Big Prairie before he married Margaret. Those are her parents. To the west, ranches and eventually town. To the east, a finger of forest land again, and Cody knew every direction, including home, the Lindsay's place one further east, across the old split rail fence that needed repairs each spring. Mr. Doyle and her father did it, but now she was old enough to help. Cody's father said to pay attention, and she did. She was beginning to think she knew quite a lot. She could tell what time it was without a watch, within a few hours anyway, if she could see the sun. The ordinary birds, violet green swallow, bluebird, golden eagle, she knew those, male and female, juvenile and grown. Ponderosa's reddest bark faced south or west, but not always, though her father wouldn't verify this, and so it was still under investigation. Part of knowing meant being able to tell the difference between a fact and a hunch. Juniper berries were actually tiny cones. Cottonwoods grew on river bottoms, or rottenwoods, her father called him, them, since whether they fell by wind or saw or snow load, the punky heartwood gave way beneath the finger like a sponge, and aspens higher up than birch, following drier soil. Poplars had the only yellow leaves, and the rest of the trees were evergreens, except the larch, whose needles changed late in fall. A river always told its origins, her father said. Walk upstream long enough, and you'd find where it started. If you were lost, you could follow water downstream to a ranch or a road, but it might take days. Cody found no arrowheads, which were next to never rare, and only, the only scat, a greasy squirt from a startled grouse. She climbed onto Daisy's back and rode down the far side of the butte into its shadow. A woodpecker flashed above and she tailed it, trying to identify which kind. Hairy was huge, downy was dainty. Pileated was rare, but hard to mistake, and flickers in the same family like a cousin with a candle of a name. Thinking about woodpeckers is how Cody rode into the herd of cows. She came up over a rise into dozens of them, clumped in the trees, grazing, some of them asleep standing, and she didn't recognize the brand, 2AA. Despite all the years she'd spent on horseback and helping with the mules and milking the Lindsay's kitchen cows before they came, became meat, Cody was not a ranch kid. Big groups of cattle, all fat and pressing, made her uneasy. When the first cow noticed her, it bellowed, and the sound passed among them like a wave. Cody heard them telling each other what to do. When one cow made a sudden move, another followed, and soon the mass of them, 30 or 40 head, ran in front of her, the calves mewling so pitifully, Cody worried they could be hurt, except it seemed unlikely they all had the same trouble. Stop whining, she thought. Thank you. That was lovely. I, w I wanted you to go on. I don't think you did the whole five minutes, but we will remain. We may get you to do that again. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, so I'm going to read from uh, this novel, The Laughter. And, uh, you know, people ask me why it's named that with this cover and everything. So you'll you just have to buy it to find out. <laughs> but... <laughs> um, 
Uh, I read uh, I read a section in yesterday's panel, and that was a humorous section. I'm going to read from the beginning of the novel um, now. Uh, so the the entire novel is written in the voice of a middle-aged white English professor, male, um, and it was my way of appropriating a white man's voice because my voice as a colonized Indian person has been uh, appropriated for centuries. So uh, see, see, yeah, exactly. <laughs> see how you like it, right? <laughs> but um, also, so I'm going to read from his voice. This is a serious part of, uh, of the book. And then a couple of, so uh, we hear from this woman, Ruhaba, that he's talking about through the whole book. We hear from her through her emails. So I'll read you a couple of her emails as well. They're better than most of your work emails, so. Uh, <laughs> it began as lust. It began as lust, that much I will admit. The events, and this is the man's voice. The events and emotions that came after were harder to reconcile. I, Oliver Edward Harding, am not one to trifle with the truth. The thing about truth, though, is that it sometimes reveals itself in the recounting, not in the living. So, while it is still fresh in my mind, I must revisit the events of these past weeks, in particular, the matter of the boy. The straight and sure lines within these pale margins of my mind leave no other trail but those of my design. Only here might one find a true safe space, as it were, to borrow a phrase from the luminaries of our time. Do I take a risk, then, by spilling my thoughts in ink? Do I dare reveal the workings of my heart in some clumsy assembly of words? Oh, but it is such comfort to hear the scratch and whisper of pen on paper, to write by hand the way I once did as a boy with a journal. Here I am then, on a page, in a fresh notebook, committing my story to sight, my story and theirs. Before I dwell on the story of the boy and his aunt, I must state that something has been taken from me, something precious and tender, and the loss of it is so great that it may smother my account with searing emotion at times, of the kind no associate of mine would generally ascribe to my personality. I will attempt to sluice out such emotion, lance this open wound of the ghosts within, although I will not delude myself that a complete exorcism is possible. I must remember that the police prefer a clean retelling of incidents, unblemished. The gendarmerie, the boy would call them. They are leaning on me to make sense of all that happened. I must organize my thoughts here so they can have the, the spotless narrative they so desperately need. I won't, of course, share my written accounts with them, for I hardly imagine them avid readers but I will deliver to them as lissom a truth as they deserve. Were it not for their urgent and unannounced visitations multiple times a day, I would have more time to discern the most pressing matter at hand, the matter of the letter. What is to be done with this letter that is in my possession? This question has kept me sleepless until this hour of 3.45 a.m. I must choose one of two alternatives. This letter was given to me by the boy less than a week ago. He asked that I mail it to someone in time for a birthday, someone in France. I am familiar with the contents of this letter. I did not read it in a furtive lapse of ethical judgment, but indeed at the urging of the boy himself. Adil Alam, the boy, came to imagine me as some sort of mentor to him in the matters of the heart. Be that as it was, I did not advise him to change a single word in the letter. I found it rather charming, his declaration of love, written by a clumsiness endemic to those forced into solitude in adolescence. The letter was all the more endearing, I thought, for being crafted by hand, despite the poor penmanship that has resulted from the millennials' practice of texting, which has re rendered all correspondence among them to be quite literally, literally all thumbs. The contents of this letter are remarkable, not merely for their sophistication, but also because they will have a significant impact on this in the investigations of the police. And this is where my dilemma cuts deep. The boy extracted from me the sincerest promise that I will not share its contents, not even in part, not even orally, not even in concept with anyone. 
the letter was meant to leave my address and arrive at the address of one Miss Camille Harok in Toulouse, France, as close to her birthday on December 1, 2016, as was calculable by ordinary post. Today is November 3rd. Of course, all of this is rendered with greater poignancy because the author of the letter, the boy, now lies fighting for his life. If he dies, will this letter live beyond him? If he lives, whom will this letter serve? My journey of discernment must lead me to now deploy the letter in the service of love or in the service of the law. Um, and real quick, just one email from her. Um, this is an email. She sends emails to herself. Um, I am sure all of us do. Uh, to Khan Ruhaba, from Khan Ruhaba. Pick with care the kind of fools you will suffer. The secret you bear this time isn't one to let slip even to the village idiot. It will be your undoing, and what an undoing that'll be, baby girl. Do not imagine that a single person you know will understand. The one who may support the part of you that is woman will not stomach this kind of woman. The one who may support the part of you that is Muslim will not support the kind of eruption you devise. The one that loves you as the radical will abhor the part that summons the, ex the exquisite. Men, mothers, lovers, professors, friends, students, grocers, the world will say you are evil from head to... Thank you. Sonora and I appear a lot together and I love it. I love sitting next to this woman. I'm so grateful to meet you for the first time, Christine, and also to see your hands and know how much work has gone into the land uh, through these hands. I grew up ranching in North Central Florida. And so it's, um, and I, I was like, I'm not gonna do the cow sound for you, although I perfected it as a child. Um, <laughs> but I wanna thank the Montana Book Festival for having us and all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to read a short, uh, scene from my novel, Subduction. And yesterday, I, during our sly, witchy, twisted free panel, I, I read a section that was sorted, uh, the aftermath of a poor decision. Um, this is a kind of book where the characters make choices that are um, unethical, and then we have to, as, as readers, kind of think our way through the repercussions of those choices, rather than I think the kind of more propagandist method of many commercial fiction to kind of show on the page what is the author thinks is right, right? We don't always know. Um, and that ambiguity, I think, forces us deeper into ourselves as, as readers and as humans, and it's why I write and it's why I read. Um, hi. Uh, so um, I am going to read this section. Um, I like the title of this panel, Elusive and Ever-Present. I think sexual attraction is like that. Um, and so while yesterday I read the aftermath of this anthropologist who uh, drags her damage into an indigenous community and begins an affair with the son of her uh, best hope for a meaningful qualitative study, um, today I'm going to read a short section when they are walking on the beach, having not arrived at any decision. So. They had talked on the porch but once they passed through the narrow wooden gate to the beach, they stopped talking and just walked, shuffling and squeaking through the peaks and valleys of dune grasses, which were sparse, and the kind of green that Claudia last saw on olive trees. The beach grew firmer, crunchy with bands of shells and littered here and there with heaps of kelp. Elsewhere on the reservation, the driftwood seemed from another time, the fallen trunks taller than people, their rounded root systems tipped toward the sky, carving dark suns into the horizon. But here, where bonfires were a ritual of witness and involved beer and lots of cigarettes, where tourists pocketed anything pretty with the sly acquisitiveness of raccoons, the driftwood was spare, and so were the good shells. Claudia had thrown out so much before she left Seattle, shedding her shells and pebbles with the practice satisfaction of a dog shaking off a bath. Some of her beach glass had been gathered here. Peter kicked a can and scowled at the container ships off the coast. For all she knew, her trash boarded a ship on its way back to Asia, destined for a distant beach community and its own flocks of garbage pickers. Peter cleared his throat and paused as he came between her path and the shore. The pale sun backed behind the clouds, snuffing out the shadows of his face, his black hair absorbing all the light, 
as black as anything around it, blacker. Stop staring, she told herself, and smiled, bright, but he did not return it, and kept instead a steady gaze that said he had seen her hunger. She dropped her eyes to the tangled bull kelp at her feet, their slimy fronds twisted around a net at the rack line, where breakers made their final sally before retreating, restless. A cloud of black flies floated around her ankles, her tennis shoes squished into a nest of smaller sea plants. Claudia stepped past the wreckage of the last high tide and onto the smooth flat sand, and they kept on, not talking, their footprints erasing themselves with damp exhales from beneath, the closest she'd get to leave no trace, or walking on water. The sea stood up and toppled over, driving kelp and sand into itself before rising again and again, reaching for the shore. Its passage left a thick sheen on the crust of crushed shells, which rolled on their sides and sighed, sated. Their shoulders brushed once and again as they walked, footsteps moving toward and away from each other in subtle waves that stretched long with the languid tempo of dune ridges. Ruddy cliffs held back a cedar forest that spilled over, curving toward the sea atop a dark headland, tide pools bared to the sky. She kept her focus on that outcropping, trying not to watch Peter from the corners of her eyes as they drew nearer. His shadow at her periphery had taken over her full attention. Grazing his hand, her entire body aligned to him like filings on a magnet, and she looked without looking, hearing his weight change on the beach. She was relieved when they came to the headland's surf-addled rock. Where air had been, life crept in, a profusion of glossy mussels and rough barnacles, orange and purple sea stars, lime and crimson anemones, and emerald plants she could not name. Claudia crouched before the first pool, its stillness a pane of glass onto a world that did and did not pertain to her. A velvety red anemone swayed, stirred by some unseen force. She pushed a finger into its cold home, slow and careful. The anemone tuned to her, its rubbery receptors waving in her direction, beckoning. They clung to her as she slipped her nail into the folds of its body, trying to be gentle. It held her, and she lingered, feeling how dear this was, its aggressive embrace, and how it was this creature's weakness, and not the ferocity of its intent, nor the cunning of its perception, which made it dear. Her power inspired a rising tenderness. She tickled, but poked no further, inclining her head so a sky mirror drew over the pool, and she could regard herself being maternal. Beside her shifting face, she saw Peter. His eyes were on her. The air thickened into mist, blurring their reflection. Come by again tomorrow, he said, and left her there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for those readings. Uh, so I want to kick off with kind of a dis kind of the central question of this panel, and then we're going to dig in deeper, which is what defines a literary novel as opposed to any other sort of novel uh, for you? So, this is a perplexing question because when I'm asked to define something, my brain goes into dichotomy overdrive, which is not necessarily useful for a panel conversation. <laughs> so I'll preface it with that. Um, I have a bit of um, uh, mixed feelings about the word literary novel. One is deep belief that the kind of novels we're writing need a different name than another good novel by Michael Connolly about a detective named Harry Bosch who I love and I buy them as paperbacks and I read them on planes and I think they're great. But it doesn't seem like that's the same kind of book so part of me thinks that's useful. Um, but another part of me rustles a little under the slate pretension that it has. I, I hear my grandma who came from very little and aspired to much more pronouncing it literary. <laughs> so when I, that's the echo of pretension in my ear that it's grasping to say it's something that I would rather it just be able to be experienced as. So that's the tension for me that all of the defining operates under. I get why we need it and I think it's valuable, but I do have a bit of, it doesn't sit right with me if I'm on a plane and someone asks me, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm a trail builder, and oh, I'm a writer, and oh, like, like James Patterson, or whatever they're reading, and <laughs> saying, no, I'm a literary novelist would probably never occur to me. 
but there is a, a conversation that's different than, yeah, like James Patterson. So that's my tension. Maybe you guys can make more of it than that. <laughs> Uh, that's great because I actually love the pretension, <laughs> um, especially because I, there was this conversation. My, my brother writes some detective fiction. Um, he lives in India, and we don't get along. I hate him, and uh, <laughs> um, and we were at this literary uh, uh, conference together, uh, Lit Fest in India together. And this journalist said, oh my goodness, this is so interesting, a brother and sister duo that write, and decided to interview us together, and I was hating it, right, because I'm, I hadn't talked to him in years, and now I'm supposed to sit down to an interview with him. I think he orchestrated it, but, <laughs> but uh, we sat down, and then uh, she said, oh, you're joshing together, which was not, I was, so um, he said something like, uh, uh, Oh, I said something like, oh, she said, what do you think of his books? And I said, I haven't read his books because I don't read detective fiction. <laughs> and he said, well, I haven't read hers because I don't read literary fiction. And I think he ended up sounding worse than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, I will read detective I do, of course, and I love, the, I love them. But, uh, <laughs> but somehow him saying that was, just gave me a sense of like, what an idiot. Like, why would you say that, you know? So, so that's how pretentious I can get. But, but, uh, but the, the truth thing is that I, I, I agree that I don't think there's really any... I, when you sit down to write and you're contributing to, to uh, ideas and to the world and to story, I think that is literary. You're being literary. And so I think... Those, those distinctions are problematic. Uh, someone said that this was sort of read like a little bit of a literary thriller, and I was like, great. Like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's like these genres crossing, and I love that the, the, that the boundaries are breaking down now and that we can do so many experimental things and draw from other genres. Um, but I do like certain things that literary novels do. I think what, they, what we concern ourselves with are where we begin with an idea and characters are important and the story, you can leave the story where you want and um, it's sort of like a piece of life and it's, you can dwell on what, whatever part of it you like and you don't have to write to a certain template or a certain expectation. Those are the things I like. So I think those, that defines, I, I don't think it's a clear definition, but an explanation or a justification, I guess. Thank you. Sonora, you'll never know what she'll say. You just don't know, which I love it. Um, and it's great. Um, so I would like to answer this question in two ways because I am a novelist, but I'm also a book critic. And so um, as a novelist, what I have found is that um, the things which compel me into writing are not for a formula, right? If you read aspects of genre fiction, by page 50, this has happened. By page 75, this has happened. And they're very deliberate about that. And I really admire the prolific nature of many genre writers. It is very hard to produce 25 cozy mysteries in a row. Okay, and those people work hard and I admire them and I'm glad for them. I'm glad that they're making, they're finding a way to make it work. I do not read those books. And I actually, I asked my editor, even like Isabel Allende, right? She's amazing as a writer. She's so prolific. But my editor tasked me with reviewing the book and I was horrified because I had to pan it, right? I'm not going to write a positive review of a badly written book. So I had to open the review saying, you know, my Cuban mother really asked me to get out of this review. And she did. My mom texted me and she's like, can you get out of doing the Allende review? You know, because I don't think it's going to be good for you, you know, because I didn't want it, and I, which is true. You know, I didn't want to do it, but I had to, right? Because let's say that book is a long pedal of the sea. It is a uh, work. It sounds, it should be amazing. It's uh, Pablo Neruda commissioned a ship to take refugees from Franco Spain to Chile, right? I mean, it's a good premise, right? But she has in a section with Pablo Neruda, like riding over the coastline, hearts are throbbing, okay? The most real thing about that book was how all the women worried about their weight, and I hated that truth because I had to read the book to the end regardless, right? So when you see the mechanisms of plot that are more carefully crafted than the, what that action is taking place and changing with the character, that is how I would define genre fiction. The movement of the story is more important than the movement of the heart, unless it's throbbing, right? <laughs> so, like, so that's that. Um, for me, literary fiction operates, so I, I, I'm a great lover of fractals. 
Um, they're self-repeating, self-similar patterns that occur at various orders of magnitude. You can see the fractals in the ridge lines. You can see them in the uh, centers of flowers. You can see them on waves. You can see them in sound. I mean, they're, they're repeated everywhere. And most of us as artists inadvertently create fractals in our work. If you look at the work of Jackson Pollock, for example, it seems random, but you find fractal patterns within the paintings. Good literary fiction, the characters, the landscape around them, the way that they interact with each other, the movements of their own heart, the cultural topography, all of that is working in a fractalized, self-repeating, self-similar pattern. It is very hard for us as humans to escape those patterns. And one of the ways that I think that literary fiction can drive us deeper into the possibilities of the future is by asking us to consider whether the patterns we've been arriving within are the same ones that are going to carry us forward and if is that the way that we want to be carried forward so they ask us literary fiction asks us to think and feel differently than we have in the past and that challenge is part of the reason why people don't read it because they want to read books that make them feel like a coca-cola makes them feel right slightly fizzy sugared up caffeinated ready to go right and so and that reflection is now becoming more and more countercultural and i think that even though we are reaching potentially a smaller audience with literary fiction the work that is being done there will emanate outward and is still worth doing those are all excellent answers uh i do think that they break down in interesting ways too uh Christine, you you saw it as a feeling. Uh, Sonora, it's a distinction of genre a little bit. And uh, Kristen, it's uh, it's the priority of plot over uh, plot over uh, characterization and description, or vice versa. And I think that each of you plays with that in a specific way. So I'm going to go down the line again, if you don't mind. Uh, Christine, uh, as far as the feeling goes, uh, you have, you start out with sort of this pace that, you know, it's a slice of life. Uh, it's almost sketch-like in how it sets you into the, this world, but then you jump in time. So what made you, what made uh, the, what, what made the feeling because you kind of sustain that sort of feeling and that pace, but you jump in time and you jump in the number of voices and perspectives that you use. So where did all of those other voices come from that speak in this town beyond this one family? That is a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, let me try to um, organize my thoughts a little bit. So um, as far as the question about time, um, I read, I think it was Stuart Dybeck, the short story writer, um, who wrote something about, I think when he was teaching MFA students, about the, the danger um, in writers writing a first novel, which mine is, in getting stuck in a level of micro description that then you can't sustain over an entire novel and make a world, unless you're doing a, the day, you know, the James Joyceian, like you're, you're really focused and you can afford to spend every detail. I was aware of that notion that I, I'm very descriptive and place-based and I want to convey a very specific scene, but I didn't want to be trapped in. And then she sipped her coffee and then she opened the door and then the micro movements of life. So I, I was aware of, and I come from a short story writing background, so I tried to think about each chapter as a, not a short story at all, but that as a, a thing unto itself. And so then if I could draw that thing to somewhat of a close, then I would be free to skip forward to something else where I didn't need all the connective tissue. And, and that's one thing I love about poems. I'm not, I don't publish poems really, but I draft a lot in poems with character work especially. And I love the freedom in poetry where you don't have to have all the connective tissue, the, the syntax or the time, way time flows, you can discard it a bit more easily, I think. And I love that. So I wanted to aim for that same sort of feeling. Um, the multivocal part came in a bit strangely in that I wrote the, what was the first chapter, which is in the same voice of the chapter I read. It's the, the third person close, Cody. It's every other chapter is that narrative. And then the, every other chapter between is a first person persona of some character or third person and second person in one case. Um, 
And it was because the first chapter came out first, like 25 years ago in a, in a class where I was supposed to write a short story and I realized it was a novel and put it away. And then like 20 years, 50, 10 years later, I wrote a different short story in the first person and I'll just read two lines so that you can feel what I felt, which was startling. So the first couple lines of the book are uh, so many pages. The summer of the fires started cool and damp. A heavy snow in early May buried pasc flowers and daffodils and the barely rising shoots that would become the season's crops. But by the end of the su month, the sun lit up like a match and so on. And then it's Cody in her bedroom and she wakes up and it's the third person like I read from. Then this completely weird story comes out 10 years later. Let me find it. I'll just read the first line. Oh, for Pete's sake. That's what all these bookmarks are for, and then I can never find them when I'm looking. <sighs> okay, the first, the first line is basically, hey, Jess McCafferty, what the hell are you doing in here? I can see you behind the shelf, and you think I can't. Yeah. <laughs> but that's basically all you need to know. It's so different, totally so different. And by the end of the story, when I went back to revise it, I was like, I think this is the same kid. There's something about the emotional life of the child at nine and about the older sub-teen, tween, was the same character. So then I had to figure out, okay, do I try to shoehorn the first person into the third? Do I? And then I was like, well, what the hell? What if I just write every persona that I can think of, thinking that might be the ballast of the book that didn't necessarily need to appear, and then that eventually became the structure. So we've got feeling. Now, genre. Uh, Sonora, uh, the book opens kind of at the end a little bit, uh, but it, it starts with the, the voice of Oliver so strongly, and you, you read those opening lines, and at least for me, uh, when I started reading them, uh, it was almost a turnoff because I was like, who is this asshole? <laughs> Uh, the, the, he seemed like an Ethan Kanan character who showed up in a story with real stakes. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, but I, I like how you brought up Thriller because that's what it seems on its face, especially when you start it that way. But we really start to chart the journey of this guy as he becomes subsumed in his, uh, own, like, it's, it's not even bigotry, it's the paranoid intellectual side of him. So I, I want to talk about how you came across that journey for him and that how that anchors it as like a different kind of story than a plotty one. Uh, yeah, thank you for thinking of him as a jerk and an asshole. That was <laughs> deliberate, or getting mad at him. Um, I, you know, uh, it's so interesting. So I, the book, it, I didn't, I didn't start out wanting to write in his voice and write about his journey at all. I actually was thinking of writing in three different, from three different points of view of the three main characters in the book. Um, but I was, I was writing this. I actually, the the story that I was attracted to as a uh, or obsessed with as a journalist was in 2016. This book is set in November 2016, where something really interesting happened in our country. And um, and it's the it's the few days before Trump was elected, um, but I the, that that previous summer something was happening in France is burkini bans on Muslim women, and I was getting very obsessed with that story. I found myself reading everything I could on these women were being banned from entering the water wearing their full garb, and I was like what is this obsession with women's clothes and women's freedom, you know, um, and I was getting full of rage. And so I applied to a writing residency in France to go, um, so I could actually go there and start, you know, talk to people, uh, French Muslims, and talk about this. And I thought maybe there's a, there's a novel that, that's, uh, that's in that. And then this conf confluence of uh, the Trump election and having to imagine this sort of uh, white radicalization, which later in later drafts I could really lean into that of a white man being radicalized while he's afraid of the Muslim radical uh, radicalization. And so, uh, so while I was there, I started to write this, and I was I was writing this story in the three points of view, and the, the Trump election um, news came in, and I found this voice actually take over. 
and I kept, it just kept taking over, sort of like being interrupted by a man in a meeting or something, you know, like my, my voice was just like, I kept saying like, okay, maybe third person omniscient, I'm going to write the omniscient narrator. Nope, this was the guy who was writing it. And I was like 20,000 words and he's still writing it. And I kept looking back and trying to change it. And then I said, I'm, I'm just going to give up. Okay. You're just going to write the story, but I'm going to write it from under your skin. So I'm going to tell your story while you think you're telling my story or, or the story of these people. And so it was more like just giving in to that voice rather than really starting with some grand idea. And then I, then I of course, wanted to, in terms of his journey, I wanted to play with these tropes of, you know, the typical thing of a, a, a white man's journey and the people of color coming in and changing his heart, sort of like the Clint Eastwood, Gran Torino kind of thing, like, oh, those people are so kind, now I love them and I'm going to rescue them, right? So I wanted to mess with that old journey and... I read some of the reviews on Goodreads and that's pissed some people off because they wanted to see this transformation. Like, that's what I'm in this for. Like, show me how this guy becomes a good guy because it's got to be about him, right? But it's not necessarily. It's more about the idea of who gets to tell what story. So that's all. I, I think you, you, just, you just took it and it, it, it seemed to belong with you. I don't <laughs> uh, so, uh, fin finally, uh, Kristen, uh, the, um, you, you with the plot versus characterization, uh, you're, I think the number one thing that I really loved about this, it's two voices and they keep screwing up and going backwards. There's a lot of one step forward and two steps back. And that's real. like, as someone who writes, that's really hard to do. That's really hard to l make characters live within their mistakes and continue forward. So there's a realism there, but there still is kind of this, like, they all have goals and they all have, uh, you know, they, they propel forward. So where, where did you find that balance to make it a story instead of a sketch of, like, two people who are in their own way? Well, we're all in our own way, right? Um, I think that we all live in permanent states of non-disclosure. And even when we pretend to revelation, even when we pretend to confession, even when we pretend to um, create a sense of intimacy, we are always, as people, holding something back, and often from ourselves. And so one thing that I wanted between these two characters at one point, I envisioned having uh, other parts, uh, other characters within the novel be speaking characters, but I decided not to in part because what Peter and Claudia do not reveal to each other is the pivot point of everything that happens between them. And so the book moves around and pivots on this architecture of what is unsaid. And so in order to track that, having only their perspectives... Um, allowed for that tension. And um, also because, uh, fractals, right? Uh, the idea of subduction for those who are unaware, but I'm, I'm, I actually had to push back and keep that as a title because the people are like, well, they're never, no one's gonna know that. I'm like, well, I think they might. But um, subduction zone earthquake is uh, created when two tectonic plates, uh, one is stuck below the other and it starts, it's diving down, but the pressure builds and when it finally slips, uh, you get a, an earthquake. We're overdue uh, in the Seattle area. Uh, I'm sure you'll feel the repercussions of it here when that does happen. Um, but having that metaphor also work for uh, the ways that story is wielded by these characters, by the way that truth and omission are wielded, they're weaponized in many ways, uh, and also the cultural interaction between these characters uh, and the power that they each hold over each other. It felt important uh, just to have it be uh, Peter and Claudia. That's great. Uh, yeah, uh, so one, one thing that also, kind of the reason why I united all these novels here is they all have an incredibly strong sense of place and um, it's, it's something that you often don't necessarily see in a lot of more literarily bent novels is 
And I think it's because there's that fear of becoming a tourist to a place. So how did you all each ground your novels in the areas they're from? And what, what was your guiding rule when uh, choosing the various settings and uh, sort of the, the characters and shapes that those take? When I talk about setting, I always remember uh, when I was in junior high, I think it was, and I learned about the parts of a novel or a story. You know, you have the characters and dialogue and setting and plot and all that. And I, especially with the books that I like to read a lot, which were books about kids and the West and animals and escape and orphans and all of that, um, I never understood why setting wasn't a character. Because in those books that I loved, it, it absolutely was. So... In a way, I think the, it's not so much that the people in this book are set against the backdrop of Western, Northwestern Montana. It's that Northwestern Montana is an abutting character to these people. And it makes them who they are, and they make it who it is to each of the others. And um, so as far as how you, the practicalities of carrying that off, for me, a lot of it is about time. The first uh, chapter that I mentioned, I wrote when I had lived here only two years. I actually lived in Missoula um, for about eight years, from 95 until 2002. Um, I didn't go to school here. I, I was just an ordinary broke Missoulian who thought it was beautiful and was willing to work as a grocery checker to live here. <laughs> um, so I wrote that first story, and much of the plot and the character work is the same, but the place, the place in it was very immature. I had only lived here not even two full years. I didn't know yet in an embodied way what birds you would find and what weather would be normal for what time of year and when the light would be like this as opposed to like that. And so for me, writing about a place, if it's a, a real place and it's important to me that that place acts as a character, I need to have a, an intimacy with the place that's not researched that I can rely on in the same way that writing about people, I feel like I need to write about people that I can know, that I have experienced or have empathy for or watch with curiosity and so I, I think I, I approach the place similarly I haven't written in depth about a place that I haven't lived or known well so maybe there would be an act, uh, kind of a, a cool um, exercise to try with that but I, that's how it works for me I love that you mentioned empathy because one of the things too about literary fiction is that uh, there are all these studies that have been done about how literary fiction more than any other genre is um, is conducive to evoking empathy in people, uh, no matter what, you know, how different someone's uh, life is from yours. But there's something about a shared experience and a universality to that lived experience that people will feel something about. And I've heard that from people so often about when they'll read something that's set in India, where I'm from, and they'll say, oh my God, like, you know, it's set in that place and like, I so feel for these, like these, I can't get these characters out of my head. And the, the lives being described are so different, but they're so, uh, but people feel the sense of connection, right? Um, and, and, and to that end, like the setting for me, I, I don't have an MFA and I'm, my background is in journalism. So I just feel like I'm, I'm learning as I go, as I go. Um, and for me, I remember reading um, a Confederacy of Dunces, which is set in uh, in Louisiana, in uh, New Orleans. And I remember reading it while I was in India. I'd never been to the US and really feeling like, what is the city? And the setting is really a character there with Ignatius Riley uh, being this really unique character and, and New Orleans being, being a character as well. And I remember thinking of that. I remember thinking like, what is this town that is so you know, that, that I, I can so vividly picture in my head, and this was before the internet and before Google Images and stuff. And then I went, uh, I didn't know this, but I was going to go to LSU to study, and then I went to that city, and I was like, oh my God, this is the city of Ignatius Riley, and <laughs> people didn't necessarily <laughs> like that. And so, <laughs> so I knew that I wanted to make a city a character at some point in something that I wrote, and so I got a chance to do that with Seattle in this book, uh, and it's, uh, it's really Seattle and academia, academia as a setting, um, and Seattle definitely with its sort of like liberal ways and it's, you know, Seattle nice is what we call it. So I thought that that would be a great one to exploit. So I really enjoyed making Seattle a character in this book. Complicating Seattle nice. <laughs> and she moved there. Um, 
So I like something that an earlier panelist said, uh, Cindy was saying uh, about uh, letting your obsessions in. Um, I traveled to Nia Bay the, for the first time as a Macaw Nation in 2005. And I had always been taught, I'm Latina, I'd always been taught this narrative about myself and my family as this bootstrap narrative. We work hard, we work harder than everybody else around us. And over time, that is why we have accrued the advantages that we've accrued. Going out to Nia Bay taught me for the first time that although I am a, a, you know, an immigrant and Latina, um, I'm also a settler. And what does that mean? What kind of commitment or understanding does that require? And then once you've arrived at that, that understanding, what kind of action is, is needed? So it took uh, many years of study. Um, I did travel out to the Macaw Nation. Um, I just recently was actually there this last weekend. And I think for me, the importance of place was more than just about getting the, the landscape descriptions right. It was about understanding the, and trying to get to an approximation of an understanding of something which is, may always remain beyond the understanding of anyone who's not indigenous, which is what does it mean to actually belong to a place? Thousands of years, thousands of years in the same place, having grown up there, your, I, I edited this collection called Seismic that uh, concludes with an oral history. It was to um, commemorate and kind of scrutinize uh, Seattle's designation as a UNESCO city of literature. And so it was a great honor for me to, to edit that. And I asked uh, Chief Seattle's great, 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 great grandson to share an oral history with me. Uh, this collection is free online, uh, so you can check it out anytime. Um, but he said, you know, um, reflecting, his name is Ken Workman. He said, reflecting on Chief Seattle's speech, at one point he said, you know, you will be walking the streets of your city and our ghosts will be thronging around you. And people have always taken that as metaphor. And there's a lot of question about the interlocutors for that speech, how it was uh, transcribed from Le Chutzid into uh, English, you know, when that transcription happened, to what purposes the speech has been uh, applied. But Ken himself is a Boeing engineer, or retired as a Boeing engineer. So he said, well, let's look at this speech as actual fact. What are the facts? Y'all came here, okay, and you cut down these beautiful big trees to build your city. Well, guess what? We buried our dead in canoes in the branches. You knock a hole in the bottom of the canoe, the rain comes down, and the organic material of our ancestors has flowed down into those roots and up into those trees. So we are in the bones of all of your buildings and we are all around you, and we are still here as living peoples and also as the innermost architecture of the city that you built on stolen land because the Duwamish have still not received federal recognition. So thinking about that question of belonging and how is it that one can belong, encroach, be invited, be welcomed, it's something that I really struggled with and I was very grateful uh, just last uh, Tuesday, um, I went out camping at Shai Shai Beach. It's a beautiful uh, wilderness area in the Olympic National Park. And my friend, uh, Joe McGimsey, who had been one of the spiritual directors for the whale hunt that the Macaw uh, did in 1999, he said, you know, we're gonna do this blessing of the Suez River because there's a new fish weir slash dam. Y'all come out for it. Um, it's gonna be at 2 p.m. And I'm like, okay, but well, my whole family will just been camping for three days, so I'm gonna look a little rough, you know? And he's like, it's okay, it's okay, just come. So we get there, and Joe invites my son, uh, Wilder, um, into the ceremony. And he asked Wilder, there's another macaw child there, um, and he asked Wilder and this other child, because their hearts are still pure, um, and have not yet been influenced by all the baggage that we all bring, Right, uh, and they were kind of stroking the water with cedar boughs as they blessed the river. And in this way, despite the fact that I am not from there, th they welcomed my family into the blessing of this river that is a life force for the fishermen and other peoples uh, of, um, of the Macaw Nation. And so that is an honor then that is lifelong and intergenerational. And so it requires then what will I do? What will my family do if the Suez River is encroached upon by pollution brought by industrialization and the waves of gentrification that I'm also part of, right? So these honors and the welcome of the place also confer responsibility. 
um, which is something that I'm going to be explaining to Wilder again and again, right? Because at the end of the ceremony, they paid Wilder. They, when they do a ceremony, they pay people for witnessing. And so they paid Wilder. And I'm like, you know, you think you receive money, but actually what you have right now is a great debt. You have a great debt to this people and to this river and to this land. And so that idea of then allowing the place to reshape our own connections with each other and with our future actions, I think is a lesson that I learned from decades of um, going out there. Uh, well, Kristen, you did shame me a little bit because usually when a Montanan asks that question, it, it comes from an incredibly petty place. <laughs> I, I, there, you, we, we keep track of every single tiny little error in any sort of description of any place that we know. Uh, so, and you gave such a beautiful answer that changed how I look at it now. Um, so, uh, we're going to open this up to everyone else to kind of interrogate these ideas that we've been working on. But I do want you all to share one more passage from your books because they're all extraordinary books. And I am spoiled that I get to be the one to talk about them. Yeah. Let, let, let's go backwards this time. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, Kristen, you just looked ready. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so, uh, Hello. Yes, yeah, good. Um, all right. I'm going to read from Peter's perspective. It's a, right. By the time they unearthed the colorful stacks of paper plate holders, his mother was whipping up batter. Peter felt sick to his stomach, wanted to tell her, don't make fry bread, but couldn't. Not when it would get her out of the way. The cleanup was ticking along smoothly, he and Claudia sorting bags of tchotchke. True, seeing evidence of his mother's obsessive, disordered mind made him feel like dying. He plunged his hands into hundreds of Nia Bay keychains, colors revealing their era of origin, first the beige and navy of the late 70s, then the fuchsia and highlighter yellow of the 80s, followed by the mauve and white 90s, which is when she seemed to have moved on to other things. Claudia wasn't saying much as she squatted over the piles, but he could tell that she was thinking on something because her brow was furrowed, and she didn't seem to notice the aroma drifting from between her legs, warm and pungent. To be frank, she smelled like raw clams left in the sun, but he forgave her, considering that this was their smell, and the only reason he didn't find it familiar was that he liked to be long gone by this time after a tryst. Peter watched Claudia sort keychains by color, plopping them into plastic grocery bags, and he didn't bother to correct her obvious waste of time, happy to see her silky black hair fall over her cheek. From certain angles, she looked like she belonged here, and if he let himself think that way, it would be something to settle down with such a pretty lady, even if she's on the skinny side. A man didn't need much more than a truck and a woman and a place to park them both. They could buy a new house and set it down where this broke down old trailer was as soon as it worked out. Guilt broke in. He was daydreaming about his mother's passing, and there she was, in the kitchen. Luckily, Claudia didn't seem interested in sorting the fried food baskets by color. She stacked them off to the side, and the puzzled look on her face being replaced by something more, a gradual dawning he wished she would share. We should throw this shit away. He kicked at a pile. She winced. I mean, recycle it, donate it, whatever. There's nothing useful here. I think she was saving it for a reason. Claudia traced a thin grid of a plastic basket designed to hold a square of paper and fries, something crispy and delicious, but which had instead for years held its dusty twin. Claudia inserted her fingers into the lattice, lifted a few from the stack, let them drop. I'm sure she thought so, but we know better. Peter grabbed the bags of keychains. It's got to go. This place is a fire trap. You should have seen the newspapers, the phone books. She couldn't even move around, and it smelled. There's no plan here. Claudia did not answer him. Instead, she undid the knot of another bag, pulling from it four blankets, the kind Peter remembered from every couch of his childhood but last saw at truck stops, thick velour in royal blue and crimson, covered with airbrushed wolves howling at the moon and eagles with outstretched wings. His mother's bed had nothing but a thin duvet cover with no down comfort inside it. She didn't like to sleep hot, she said, but it bothered him how she stinted herself while keeping blankets for beds that had never been made, never been slept in. She was a goner. She'd been long gone by the time he got back to her. He didn't know what he was hoping for when he bagged this shit in grief and desperation, troubled by her repeating mind, her addiction to worthless household items, the acquisition of one, then another, and another, never satisfied with what she had, already fixated on the one coming down the pike. Kind of like his serial fuckery, but there's no mass grave of past lovers to shame him. And yet here was hers, disinterred. Thanks.
resting it finally. <laughs> um, I will. I wasn't expecting this, so nice one. I tricked you. I know, nice one, Sam. Um, let's see. Is this the one I want to read? Oh, I thought I picked a section. Hang on one sec. Do you want to go ahead and sure, read? I was yeah. going to say, I didn't want to. <laughs> I'll rescue you. <laughs> All right, I'll read the, um, the chapter that I referred to that I couldn't find. So this is the first person of Cody Kinsler, who's the girl who was on the horse. She's a bit older. This is the 50 pages in or so. Um, and uh, yeah. Hey, Jess McCafferty, what are you doing here? I've never seen you in our store before. I bet you're looking for my sister, but she isn't here. And even if she was, I'd say Louisa isn't here right now because she doesn't love you anyway, Jess. I know you know who I am, but you walk by without a word. What's so interesting about the floor? Do you know I'm by myself? Pop trusts me even though I'm younger than Louisa. And besides, she has better things to do than hang around in a hardware store all summer. She says, you'll get it when you're 15. But I like the smell of the linseed oil pop rubs into the countertop and the light in the glass above the front door. I can read when the store's empty. Louisa, she likes things faster. You can sleep when you're dead, is what she says. You think my sister's in love with you, don't you, Jess? I know she's made you think so, sneaking out the window at night, dropping into the flowers, into your hands. But sisters get each other, and that's how I know she's making a fool out of you, Jess. She likes you, okay, how your eyes make her feel like it's hot under her skin, but like and love are two different things. Louisa, you better look out, I tell her, but she already knows. You only smile at me because I'm her little sister, otherwise you never even see a girl like me, would you? Well, you know what, Jess? Louisa lets me borrow her clothes. I'm wearing her jeans right now, the ones she embroidered at the hem. We wear the same size, but she likes them tight, and I like them baggy. You're so lucky, Cody. You're so skinny, my sister says, and she won't eat at dinner sometimes, and she stands in front of the mirror at night and sucks in her cheeks and holds the skin around her middle with both hands. Hey, Jess, did you know me and Louisa have shared a room since I was born? I could tell my sister from a hundred strangers lying down in the dark just by the way she breathes. Okay, so this is an Oliver's voice again. An academician's office is a dismal place. Semesters go by in the predictability of students' papers arriving on one's desk and coffee mugs drained and forgotten during glassy-eyed grading. Office hours are a puddle in which minutes drip and drip and drip with no students in sight, as if they indeed had no debate with Chesterton's arguments against modern relativism. Janitorial staff came in at night to dust around the bookcases, but they were trained to never touch the piles of journals, even those from as far back as 1998, nor the shattered spines of books left open to, to a page since 2002 on the academician's desk. So they'd miss the drying peels of mandarin oranges and leave the academician to find them blackened or moldy every time he had the spark of an idea and shuffled into paper in search of a reference. This month of October bore down especially hard on the academician's office in our town of Seattle. Take my, windows, my office windows, for instance. I had the best office in the Department of English, better than that of even the current department chair, a fine Nigerian woman who taught post-colonial studies. My office had a row of three windows, and hers, one. But what I hadn't consider, considered when I made a power play for the office with the three windows was that I would have three times the swath of gray sky for the nine months beginning in October. <laughs> Three times the view of the row of full moon maples as they lost their leaves and turned to twigs. Three times the damp seeming, seeping in through the glass. Three times the view of students shuffling around through the quad below, dressed in their black Uniqlo puffer jackets. Three times the dread of the penetrative advance of the gray as it dealt the great seasonal sadness we all would either feed or deny, we faculty and students. The latter, at least, would seek treatment, and then we would be awash in Adderall-driven attention or Zoloft-muffled anxieties. <laughs> Alrighty, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Right there. 
Yeah, just uh, you were asked the kind of the opening question about the literary novel versus genre novel, and it strikes me that a writer is going to have a different answer than uh, a publisher or a bookseller for whom these things aren't creations but products. Do you find, and I particularly I like Sonora, you mentioned the fact that there's a lot of kind of opening up and experimentation going on right now, particularly in fiction and nonfiction, the boundaries. Do you see there's a potential conflict between the two kind of perspectives? Yes. I mean, publishers uh, are terrible, and they will... <laughs> They will, uh, I mean, you know, we were talking about this on the, we, we flew in together and we were talking about this and, you know, venting and, and complaining about this because, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, we love them when they buy our books, right? Um, but yes, yes, they will try and, um, I mean, you know, all, this is my third book. My, I, my first one was a novel and the second was a memoir and now it's this novel again and each one has been very difficult to sell because the other thing that literary fiction does or literary memoir even does is that it takes risks and I think that's a really exciting thing to do and I wouldn't be able to write anything if I weren't taking a risk and we were saying that if it doesn't terrify me I don't want to do it and I can't I lose interest you know so so um so that's that's uh but then there's the one who will who will like it and like it for what it is and that's a beautiful moment and having lived through these things three times uh but then being anxious about the next thing that I'm writing and saying oh my god no one's gonna love this right so um so it is, a, I mean, I, I, yeah, so I, I am answering from the point of view of an author. So I do like that we take the risk because there is someone who is waiting for you for the ne next risk, right? There's the right agent who says, like, I love this thing and I'm going to take it forward. It's just really hard to get there. And then, of course, everyone jumps on the bandwagon. Uh, I didn't know because I didn't do an MFA. I didn't know that you can't write a whole novel or you shouldn't write a whole novel with an unlikable narrator. I didn't know this. And I would write the whole novel and I send it out. And people are like, ah, he's too unlikable, right? And then telling me to uh, t uh, tone him down a bit. And each thing, I just made him worse. And so, and so, um, but now people, you know, there was a show Succession. Everyone loved, ev that, like, that everyone is bad in that show, right? So now we suddenly love all these things. And so now it's landing well with that with that crowd, right? So I think there's always uh, these risks. We take them and we suffer and we cry and we age as we wait for someone to like it and then when it's there, it's there, you know. That is a really good question and that's one that a lot of times we don't like to think about because, you know, when, in the, in, when you're making something, you're thinking about it as what you, what it is for you, not what it's going to be for the world, or if it even will be. Um, my book is um, out with an independent press, a nonprofit, and it's actually a bit of an activist press. It's called uh, Deep Vellum, and the fiction imprint is a strange object out of Dallas, Texas. And they also have a bookstore called uh, Deep, Vellum, Deep Vellum Books. It's in the neighborhood Deep Vellum, uh, Dallas, which is a, a historically literary, amazing neighborhood, kind of a, a little bit of like a Harlem of Dallas. Um, anyway, their entire mission is to find books that are outside of what mainstream publishing will do. And it has been such a breath. My first book came out with Beacon Press, which is very similar um, in nonfiction, but they didn't publish fiction. So then I had that anxiety of like, oh, great. I made all the connections and now they're, they're moot. I don't have any for, for a novel. And so this novel went um, through many mainstream publishers, the literary arms of mainstream publishers, often someone would really love it and then it wouldn't get past marketing. Or I had a lot of like, oh, kind of bright eyes, but no follow through. So it took a lot of persistence. And then Deep Vellum came along and they were like, this is what we do. We take books that don't fit easily somewhere and then we put everything we have behind them. It was a very small advance. It's not about the drama. It's just about we're making a deal to do the best we can for this book. And they have done so wildly. And I would say that, I mean, you're at Red Hen. I'll be curious to hear you say, too, they're a small press that punches pretty pretty high. I think right now is a renaissance time for small independent presses. And I've actually had authors I know at big presses who are like, I would rather, I would rather be um, 
at a small press where I get love than at a larger press where I'm kind of making a case for myself all the time. And I hope that that continues. I feel like it it, it is on that trajectory. I, just as an aside, uh, this year, um, the, the percentage has shifted a bunch since I actually calculated it, of course. But when I last looked at it, we were at like 54% of our authors this year were from small presses, which is extraordinary, especially considering how much breadth the, like, the big five they got. I guess maybe more now? Yeah. <laughs> So one thing I would like to say, I think the danger of the pressure of the market downward onto the maker is that like this book uh, got very close to some very large presses. And what they wanted me to do to it, they wanted me to make Claudia softer. They wanted me to make her less jaded. They wanted me to make her younger. They wanted me to make her a, her own Latina version of a white savior, which she is not. So what they wanted to do was squeeze all the value out of telling this story, right? All of the complicity, all of the indictment. They wanted that gone. They wanted a nice, you know, sexy, intercultural love story. And the thing that in the end, when it was, you know, getting with prizes and whatnot, when the Paris Review, for example, named it a staff pick, the ambiguity of the, the cultural and ethical, sexual, academic choices that these uh, characters make, that ambiguity of whether they are good or bad and who in the end is dominant, that's the very reason why they chose it as a staff pick. And those are the very things that all of those publishers wanted me to take out, right? And so they wanted me to remove the value of thought of the reader. They, their anticipation of the stupidity of readers was so high they had so little respect for the possibility of thought that I thought, no, no, I'm hoping to read, I, I would like to, to have respect for my readers. And I do have respect for my readers. And Red Hen Press has been wonderful uh, with this. I mean, they came out one month after lockdowns began. Um, and, you know, a lot of presses ghosted their lineups uh, for that time and just moved on. And Red Hen Press did not. They hustle, they try, they work. Um, I work, we match each other's work ethic. I work hard as well. I'm not afraid to show it. Um, and as an indie author, you do have to. You have to work hard. Um, I am sorry to say that uh, Fact and Fiction, they only have one more copy left here. It's almost <laughs> sold out. But they said that they would order more. So if you do want it, you can ask them. Indie presses need indie bookstores. Indie bookstores are, uh, they are holding real estate in towns that will otherwise be ceded to lesser capacities, right? Uh, so thank you for everyone here who's been supporting uh, fact and fiction by buying the books uh, through them. It's important. Okay, we have time for one more. Well, we discussing what they're trying to do is sort of watering then would they have turned it into a non-literary piece? I mean, is that the thing that, you know, they could, would make a difference? They would water down so much of that content and that... Well, I mean, think about the inherent, uh, in my mind, the kind of... Um, I wanted this book to question power, question the, uh, the power of um, urban versus rural, uh, you know, white passing versus not, um, various, uh, you know, uh, sectors within the peoples of color and like, I am, you know, white passing Latina. Um, it, it's provided me an enormous amount of privilege, uh, to not be clocked at all times. Um, and that's something that I recognize, uh, that not all people have. Right. And so this is questioning that they wanted to remove those questions. So the racism also the colorism also, um, that can come in from some of the narrative choices would have made the book less. And that, I think, would it have still been literary? I mean, yeah, the sentences will still be good. Uh, but what would it be doing? Like, what's the point, right? Uh, where, where is the risk, right? And so, uh, as, as Sonora was saying, so, yeah. Um, I'm going to read this quote that I found that I think is really great, and it tags on to a couple things you were saying. This is James Baldwin. He gave a talk in 1963 called The Artist's Struggle for Integrity. And um, 
It, he says, art is here to prove and to help one bear the fact that all safety is an illusion, which at face value sounds very dar dark. <laughs> and if you're in therapy to feel safe, then it's a little daunting that it's all an illusion. <laughs> but I think that gets at what you were saying about trusting a reader. And it also gets at for me what the two if we have the polls and there's a million overlaps in the middle of all kinds of writers like Percival Everett and Michael Shaban and Zadie Smith and Dickens for Pete's sake, like who are not in either poll. But sometimes we read to help us bear the fact that all safety is an illusion. And other times we can't bear that and we want to read about who done it and who got to jail. <laughs> and I think that's fine. And I think that is not not trusting a reader to have them have both available and get to choose when they want. What? Um, so I'm really glad you said that about um, trusting the reader, because I think it's not only in the publishing process, trusting us to make books that are outside the norm, but also trusting the reader to know that they can choose any number of kinds of books, what's right for them, for us. I'm saying them, like I'm a reader. I mean, I need the same, I need the same, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, we've answered that question. Um, I would just add that, um, you know, uh, I think for writers of color, uh, especially now, there's there's a sort of scramble like, okay, yeah, yeah, we we were never racist. The publishing industry always wanted your book. Just like, no, there was there were books were around, right? But uh, we were writing. <laughs> um, but I think now there's the pigeonholing. Like I definitely with this book, it was like, well, can you tell more of the story from the point of view of the people of color in the book? And I was like, no, actually this guy wants to tell the story and I want to tell the story from his point of view. And I want to do this thing and it's, it is experimental. Have I done it well? Yeah, you've done it well, but, but, right? So a lot of rejections happened because of that, because people kept wanting me to do it in the way like, you know, I was it, that would match my skin tone, and I was like, "No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to write in a white man's voice. Just, just, just deal with it." And so then it was. It took an agent of color and a publisher where the, the editor was a man of color to publish this to see like, "Ooh, we're going to do this. Like it's like reverse. Uh, what's it called? Not um, uh, like payback or like revenge or something. You know." So it was fun. It was fun to do, but but even so. It doesn't easily fit slots, right? And I think that's the same kind of thing that we start to have. So watering down, you know, happens in these weird ways as well. Whereas, like, we really want to publish writers of color, but can you please just be a writer of color, a good writer yes. of color? Yes. <laughs> and what makes this book literary is that it's told through the perspective of a white man while simultaneously decentering that perspective. That's literary. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you all for being here, and thank you all for showing up. Uh, we do have more events today. Please donate to the festival. Please continue attending the festival. And then tonight, after we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Cup Bank, let's head down Main Street. Party. <laughs>